Hello to all of the gardeners. We are Mid-American Gardener and we're here to talk about, guess what? Gardening, plants, landscaping, bugs, whatever comes up, we're happy to chat about it and it just makes our day. I'm Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in the Crop Sciences Department here in Urbana. And I have three very talented panelists and I want you to find out who they are and you can direct your questions towards their expertise. So I'm gonna start first with you, Mark Kemp. Okay, I am a landscape architect um, and I can answer questions in regards to shrubs, perennials, just general garden design. Um, I brought a show and tell tonight. Um, uh, a lot of people are noticing this both fragrantly and visually. It is a uh, Japanese tree lilac, uh, Syringa reticulata. This one, I believe, is uh, specifically an ivory silk ver version of it. Um, it's one of my favorite uh, small trees because it'll get roughly 20 to 25 feet tall. Um, little, little maintenance to it. Uh, as you can see, it's pretty stunning in late May, early June. Um, last, the bloom lasts quite a long time. Uh, like I said earlier that it does have a fragrance, so you can, you can smell that from a distance if there's a breeze blowing or up close pretty easily. Uh, very large leaves, so it does block, uh, screen out, um, you know, uh, areas behind it. Uh, if you get one that has multi-stems all the way to the base, um, it's kind of like a large shrub as well. But you can also uh, prune those up and, and make it a little bit more of a tree form too. But mostly it's a, a large shrub or a, a very small tree. Um, as you can see with this one, very large bloom and very large leaves. Uh, I also wanted to point out that just kind of planning wise, um, one of my favorites, however, if you get a plant or plant a plant too close to um, environmental conditions that it's going to stress it, in this case, this is from the same plant, um, it's next to a large uh, air conditioner that kind of blows out and this sh part of the tree shows a lot of stress to it, smaller leaves, tattered leaves, uh, there's rarely flowers in that small section, whereas three-fourths of the plant uh, sh shows like this. So definitely plan ahead when you uh, are purchasing and planning your garden. That way you can give the plant uh, enough room to grow health in a healthy way. That's a shocking difference. Yes. It really. I'm glad it's not very much of the, right. of the plant. But. I mean, it does a really good job of blocking the air conditioner, but it probably should have been, you know, another five to ten feet mm -hmm. out further. I'm so glad you brought that plant because it, they have been fantastic this year and the University of Illinois campus has a lot of fine specimens. Very right. easy to take care of, very very few problems. Excellent. Nope, I've never seen mildew or borers no. go after them, so that's nope. another great. That you can leave the flower heads excellent. on or if you want you can go ahead and prune those off as well, but uh, it'll be attractive the rest of the year. So Japanese tree lilac. Yes. So write that a little sign on your tree if you get one and people ask you what that That's is. That's right. Because <laughs> you saw that, didn't yes. you? Yes. <laughs> Actually, it was labeled incorrectly. It was a French lilac, but it is a Japanese tree lilac. Okay. Very good. Thank you, Mark. And now I'm going to throw it over to you, Teresa Mears. Hi there. This is Teresa Mears. I'm instructor out at Parkland College. I teach a lot of the general horticulture classes, plant ID, some turf grass occasionally, take care of the greenhouse. So indoor plants is something really in my area. Um, I came across this little plant though when I was out shopping earlier this year. It's the Thugia plicata whipcord. And everybody likes the general arborvitaes. We see them all over as hedgerows. This is kind of a cousin to our traditional arborvitaes. But if you remember last summer, we were losing arborvitaes left and right because of the heat and the drought. They don't like too hot, and they don't like too dry. His common name is Western Red Cedar. He comes from the western part of the country, Seattle, Washington State, Oregon, you know, totally different climate. But everybody has a microclimate. Everybody has a little spot that something like this may fit. If he's very happy in his native area, he can get about five feet tall. Around mm. here, you might get about three feet out of him. He just doesn't do quite as well. But still very interesting if you have a nice, sunny, moist, area that isn't maybe the hottest part of your yard. And you could help it to be moist. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. For a small plant like that. But it's just a fun little something different. And Thuya, I know people don't really know how to spell it, but it's T-H-U-J-A. Mm -hmm. So that's the Arborvitae genus. If you remember whipcord, I think you'll get pretty close to it though. Oh, that is really a cute little plant. 
Thank you very much, Teresa. Mm -hmm. That's fun. And now we're going to go next to you, David Robson. Hi, I'm David Robson, a pesticide and horticultural specialist at the University of Illinois, same department as Diane. Mm -hmm. And I have um, two packages as my show and tell, and they're often on the shelves together. One is ammonium sulfate, the other one is aluminum sulfate. And the names sound familiar, ammonium and aluminum. And actually aluminum sulfate is what we use to make hydrangeas blue. Uh, the hydrangeas need the acid in the soil, but they also need some of that aluminum too. And it's the aluminum that chemically binds within the plant and changes those large macrophyllas hydrangeas, the ones that have the big leaves and suck up the water and wilt seemingly every day during the summertime, at least last year they did. But also last year they were the best they had ever been as far as in the spring, just due to the fact that we had a very mild winter. But you want aluminum sulfate. Now, you can also use it around blueberries, but you have to watch about using it on some plants because aluminum can be very toxic to some plants and it actually will start killing them. I think if I were you, I would just stick with the aluminum sulfate for the hydrangeas and it will only make the macrophylla hydrangeas turn blue. It won't make the oak leaf turn blue, it won't make the mm -hmm. annabelles, it won't make anything else turn blue. It's that aluminum reaction with the large leaf hydrangeas. Like Endless Summer, there's a whole bunch of other ones that fall on the line. Ammonium sulfate is going to provide the nitrogen, but at the same time, it's going to provide that sulfur to make the soil more acidic. Maybe the best for blueberries, maybe the best for evergreens, like Teresa's uh, whip cord right there, where they prefer the acid soil. The aluminum sulfate might be the best, or the ammonium sulfate, the ammonium. The ammonium means the nitrogen is going to be the best from probably most plants. And read and follow the directions on the package for the aluminum sulfate. People like to put that on the hydrangeas maybe two or three times a year. And right now is a good time to do it. Follow the directions, put it around the perimeter, water it in. And hopefully we have a mild winter. It doesn't kill the blossoms and you'll have blue hydrangeas next year. There's quite a few ifs in that, but oh, still. Oh, well, with those hydrangeas, <laughs> it's true. The cold is a Hi big if. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you betcha. Yes. Okay, well, there's some good education for you, but it's going to keep on going because we're going to go next to our video email. Let's go to there. Go to that now. Okay, gardeners, here's your question. My lawn, I cut it high, and with all the rain and cold we've had, I'm worrying when I cut it, I have these brown spots. You can see I'll get closer to one, whether I'm getting a fungus in there and I should cut it lower and more often. There's what some of them look like. And it's not everything, it's just patches. So there's your challenge. Okay, I always like to hear when someone says, says they cut their lawn higher. Which is good. I really <coughs> like it. As long as, you know, two, two and a yeah. half inches, that's well, great. Closer to three. Three and a half. Yeah, I go. Yeah. Because yeah. mm -hmm. the higher you cut it, the deeper your roots. And that's what we're going into now is this hot, dry summer mm -hmm. area where if you start cutting it shorter now, you're going to lose your roots and fast. I've t done many studies with my students in class where we actually do a mowing study where they come in every week and mow and we can just watch the roots just disappear on the plant. So he shouldn't change his mower no. height. Okay. No. And with the weather conditions we've had, there are some fungus out there. There are some diseases floating around. There's a lot of anthracnose on some of the trees. And turf can get anthracnose too. So the weather's changing. I mean, I could use a rain. I haven't been getting it. Mm -hmm. It's starting to cool down, but it's going to warm up again in the 80s and 90s, which the grass is going to slow down. I would just ride it out and see that it doesn't get any worse and then do some overseeding. And then, yeah, come August, rake mm -hmm. out that dead, and that's important to rake out that dead. Mm -hmm. It will create a thatch layer in there. If he really, or she, whoever, well, it sounded like a guy's voice, so we're gonna say a guy, um, but it could be a deep voice woman, so we can't be. I think it might be a they, it could okay, be a family. They. Um, <laughs> If they really want to see if it is a fungus, the University of Illinois mm -hmm. Plant Clinic can test that. Don't ever send something totally dead. You need to take that transition zone between dead and alive because that's where you're going to see Good if there's point. a disease there. If we have that screen, we can put that up for the um, 
the U of I clinic. plant clinic. And then um, make sure that you rake out that dead grass. And as Teresa said, uh, August, September is a good time to go ahead That's and overseed. Mm -hmm. And uh, just don't put too much grass seed in there because you don't want that competition. But right. if you aerate seed, fertilize water, that grass should come back. And I wouldn't, uh, it doesn't look bad enough that I would immediately run out and buy any fungicides or mess with any of that because we are at this pivotal time where the weather's mm -hmm. changing and the grass is going to shift. And fungicides for lawns are always preventatives, never curatives. Oh, that's a good point. All fungicides are. So you need to kind of watch yeah. out for that, that mm -hmm. if you have something you put it on. And the cost for a lawn fungicide application is really extremely high. They do it on golf courses, but that's because they water every night and they mow every day, and so they're yes. encouraging it. But for a homeowner, it's going to be cheaper to put in new grass seed than anything else. And that would be in August. In August. Or September. Okay. So we think you're doing okay. You just have to maybe not look so closely. <laughs> well, there was too much grass there, too. I think oh, there's yes. maybe more trees, shrubs, and flowers. And you, and you have mentioned, to I think, that. hardscape, too. Hardscape. He yeah. may not want that. No, so. it's over time, they? though. Over time. Okay. All right. Well, we're going to move on to your questions, and we're going to start with line two, and it's a question about peonies. Hello there. Hello. Uh, I have a question about my peonies. Yes. Um, they are always covered with ants, mm -hmm. and it's almost impossible to have an indoor bouquet. What do you suggest? Well, we can probably all chime in, but I'm going to suggest one thing, and then we might talk why the ants are there. But I'm going to suggest that you cut them in bud, and you, you know, they'll just they'll still be there, but you just swish it through a little bit of water, leave it outside the water, and take the bud in. You'll get quite a few more days of beauty from that peony, and the ants won't be on there because it's a tight bud, and you'll watch it open inside. Now, there are a lot of theories why the ants are there. I'd say one of them is that it's a higher concentration of sugar mm -hmm. in the spring, and since the ants are rapidly developing a larger con qual uh, colony in the spring, they're looking for any source of sugar, and flower buds tend to be a good source of sugar. You don't need the ants to open the peony buds. No, and I mean, that's, that's a theory that Right, has we want to make sure that we state that. The ants aren't going to open the peony right. buds. They're there because they're sugar sugarholics. Yeah. They're sugarholics. And, yeah. and some peonies have more sugar than others, so mm -hmm. some people don't ever seem to have the problem, and some always have the problem. Yes. And I've never seen them on tree peonies. No, I haven't either. So the concentration's different. Mm -hmm. different. Interesting. But uh, I learned that actually from my mother. She takes them in bud, mm -hmm. and so, mm -hmm. but the swishing out uh, to get them off works every time, and peonies are such a popular cut flower, so we work with them. You just don't want them out of season because they're very expensive. So yes. <laughs> enjoy them from your own lawn. Okay, thank you so much for that question. We're going to go next to line three, and it's about a pear. Hello there. Hello. Uh, put down two <laughs> honey sweet pears that were self fertile variety. Uh, the cane bear root with uh, dormant buds. And now the buds have opened from the bottom to the top of the plants and should I, my question is should I be pruning back some of those buds lower on plants that's harvested or do I leave them for the first year to, for the plant to get more strength or what do I do with them? Okay, so for a pear tree, we're all looking at each other. Are there very many on there as a general looking at the whole tree outline? I would say every bud opened and is producing leaves. Okay. I'd keep them on a fruit tree since it was bare root the first year. Okay. That would be my choice on and it's that. It's going to be small enough that I don't think you're going to yeah. incur other problems with mm -hmm. the larger amount of branching. I mean, you hear that with apple more on right. older trees, but we're going to and, and we may have one of our colleagues tell us different, but I, I would tend to leave them too. So. Okay. Well, that's just that's why I wondered if, uh, if you know, which would produce more energy, leave them all the leaves there, or leaving them all all the, the leaves with, with the too much strain on the on the trees. 
Yep. I think one season leaving them on, and then when he does remove them, make sure you sterilize the clippers yes. between each cut, only because the fire blight on pears would scares me more than anything else. Um, mm -hmm. Where you really don't want to do a lot of pruning on them, but sterilize the clippers and either rubbing alcohol or um, bleach and water between every single cut that you make on that tree. And that's very good. And that's for next year. Well, good. Thank you for being conscientious. That was a good question. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, don't go away. We're going to be right back with a special Did You Know? Okay, well, we're going to go back to our panelists and answer a question or two here. And so, Mark, I'm going to go to you first. Okay. Um, I have a letter here um, regarding maple trees. Uh, they write uh, that they have uh, several large maple trees in their yard, approximately 60 years old, um, very tall. And one of them has a hole on the north side of it about four to five feet up from the ground. It is less than a foot in height and about a uh, hand in width. It seems to go about halfway through the trunk, tree trunk. Late last fall, um, they noticed mushrooms or a fungus growing inside, um, but they, no longer, uh, they, they are no longer there after winter. Um, but of course, the hole remains. Um, they didn't really specifically ask a question, but there, this, this does bring up you know, a couple good points to kind of watch for your trees, because these are you know, 60 years old. Um, that tree is going to be weakened at that point. Uh, most likely it originated many years ago with a, a broken branch or a improperly pruned branch that kind of decayed past the, the trunk of the tree and now you have decay inside the tree. And the inside of that tree is you know, primarily there for strength. Um, and in your case you have the, the hole or the opening, the decaying uh, uh, wood inside is creating your fungus. So just kind of keeping an eye on it, keeping it uh, clean and not you know, wet and moist as much as possible. Um, it's hard to say, you really can't fill in the hole uh, per se, but you're just gonna have to keep an eye on it because it will be weaker at that point. And through wind storms and, and such, it, it, it would be kind of a liability. Okay. But proper pruning, that way the tree can heal itself. You don't get that decay. Um, you want to take those branches back to that collar, and uh, other than that, just keep them in healthy condition. Great. Thanks for answering that, and now on to you, Teresa. Well, mine is not even a question. It's just a comment, and I'm going to give her kudos because Kim Streff is uh, sharing her rose bush that she has taken pieces off over the years that her dad planted for her mom back in 1946. Oh, that's great. And it's doing outstanding and she just thinks this is one of the best years, so she wanted to share how well it's doing and how nice it is. And roses, if taken Ooh, care of right, ah. do live quite long and are quite long lasting plants. And some of the new knockouts and even the miniatures and things on their own roots just are so easy to take care of. It's a, you shouldn't be afraid of a rose now. It's not like some of the hybrid teas that mm -hmm. take so much care. So Kim's doing very well with hers there. And other folks are welcome to do that as well. Mm -hmm. This has been a great rose year. Okay, thanks Teresa. And now David. And now we talk about Japanese beetles. <laughs> oh boy. And that just moves right from the roses to the Japanese beetles. <laughs> oh wow, we didn't um, plan that. Person is asking what's the best chemical to control uh, Japanese beetles and then will they attack the ja uh, Japanese maples because they've already killed the miniature willow trees. Um, first, as far as chemicals go, uh, seven works, orthene works. Um, I would have, if somebody would have asked me earlier in the year, I would have said right around Mother's Day would have been the best time or a little bit before to use uh, amatocloprid, which is sort of a systemic insecticide. So does Bayer's tree and shrub. And you can use that on just about any of the plants and it goes within the plant, but it's not a fast acting. It usually takes four to six weeks. And while none of us have seen the Japanese beetles out yet, 
we've seen the June bugs, and so that means probably in the next week or two we're going to start seeing them. Uh, generally speaking, most of your insecticides, your non-organic insecticides, will control Japanese beetles, though malathion is probably the weakest one of that group, but orthene and seven work. Uh, go to the, the stores, look on the label, if it says to control Japanese beetles, you're going to have uh, probably the best luck with that, but follow and read the directions. Remember that the beetles are going to probably be on the top of the leaves, not on the bottom of the leaves, so it's not going to be that difficult to spray. I've never had them on any of my Japanese maples, so just because it says Japanese beetles and Japanese maple or Japanese tree lilac doesn't mean that it's going to get them. Mm -hmm. uh, I did write down the word traps, and Japanese beetle traps may bring more Japanese beetles into your area than what would have been there in the first place. So at least put it three or four doors down <laughs> on, a, on a post in the alley well. or a quarter of a mile down the country road <laughs> on a telephone pole or something like that. But uh, the traps really aren't that great as far as working. And they are a mess. They are a mess. You have to keep emptying them or doing something. Mm -hmm. So, all right. So I hope it doesn't bring Japanese beetles by talking about it. Well, let's go to our line four next, and it's about pe uh, petunias. I almost said peonies. Petunias. Hi there. Hi. Um, I purchased uh, a hanging pot of petunias uh, about a, a month ago. Um, can I hang, well, no, can I cut them back because they've grown taller than their planter? Oh, you've got Teresa here to answer this question. Oh, petunias can easily be pinched back, and you can pinch them back by half. You'll lose some of the bloom right now, but they'll just continue to fill in and be nice and lush. And petunias tend to do that. They tend to get leggy anyway, and so by pruning them back throughout the season, you're going to encourage that fresh new growth. Just pinching them back or taking clippers to them? Same difference. Uh, I use my fingers most of the time because they're not woody and they're not too hard and it's convenient. I'm just outside in the yard, but if you don't have good nails or good strong fingers, then yeah, little pruners will do it. But I don't like when people just kind of grab and do the haircut. Mm -hmm. Be a little more diligent and cut through and it's going to keep more of a natural shape. Okay, very good question and, you know, could be for other things too, but it's mm -hmm. really for petunias. All right, well, let's go next to line six about bulbs. Hi there. Yes, uh, I have uh, some daffodils and tulips, and I was wondering uh, how soon I could move them to the other flower bed I have at about 10 feet away. And also, I have a little something for you from last show when you said uh, squirrels were attacking tomatoes. I plant jalapeno peppers in a fenced-in area around the tomatoes, Ooh. and they tend to run the squirrels out by mid-season. Oh, that's an excellent, excellent <laughs> idea. Oh, I like that. I do have a jalapeno pepper near, but I don't, f I'll have to yes. do that. Thank you for that. Well, now let's go back to your bulbs, the daffodils and tulips. I'll chime in, and then you guys can chime in also. Once those bulbs actually start to yellow, you know, the leaves yellow, yellow green, then you can, there's two times to move them. You can do it right when they've ripened or yellowed, or you can mark them and try to figure out when it is in the fall. But it sounds like you want to do it sooner yes. rather than later. So I let them ripen to yellow, and then you just follow the leaf down, and you can dig them and hopefully not gore them. And then you can move them. Uh, sometimes I plant them, other times I just store them. So I don't know. I think you're supposed to put them in when it's a cooler soil temperature, but I have done the other th way and it does just fine. So, <laughs> so I don't know uh, whatever's best for you to do, but you can store them and put them in in fall with cooler soil temperatures, but I have done it right after I've dug them. Well, my grandmother always said plants can't read, so all the stuff that we say in books and yeah. you can't do it, they don't know any different. And I've done it in the fall and I've done it right now. Mm -hmm. and On the jalapenos, can... plant yes. them very close to the tomatoes. <laughs> and how many did you plant? Uh, I just buy one a year okay. and with my bell pepper and in uh, three tomato plants in a raised garden thing that's only about uh, three feet across. Wow, and that is so easy. 
yeah. to do. And then and then I fence it so that they have to come in from the top and everything's there to get them. You know, the tomatoes are there and the pe- bell or the uh, jalapenos and the bell peppers. They steal the bell peppers like crazy until the jalapenos are up and moving. And then they're too nervous <laughs> <laughs> once they they're get a jalapeno. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they take that bite and then, oh, I love that idea. Yeah, but you could yeah. use a habanero too if oh, you wanted well, to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, habaneros work real well too. And then you can just slice all those things up and make a nice gazpacho or a yeah. salsa. salsa. Yeah. Oh, well, I really like your idea, and it's organic, and it makes sense. So very good. Thank you so much. I'm glad for that comment. We have the smartest viewers. It's really interesting to see I mean, all the like good. I mean, like going right to the source. I mean, a lot of the is. trays are incorporating oh. the same idea, but it plant is. the plant. and. Well, folks, I am so glad that you have joined us. We thank you for watching. And we will see you next time. Have a great week gardening. Bye-bye. not Beirut. And I really don't want to live uh, what my parents lived because I know they told us stuff and it seems really ugly. I'm, I'm definitely not staying here.